Well, this morning we want to continue and conclude uh, a mini-series we started last week called Sufficient. And uh, what we've been doing is we did a, a study from the book of Colossians, and we've been learning about the sufficiency of Christ in our lives and in the life of the local church. So uh, watch this clip and then we'll uh, pick it up together. Mm-hmm. Coffee and Cremora. Yep, Cremora. <sighs> Where'd you put it? That was how I like my Cremora. Now she hides it. Cremora, the non-dairy creamer. It tastes so rich and creamy. You'll expect to find it in the refrigerator. And there's no Cremora in the refrigerator! It's not inside, it's on top! It's not inside, it's on top! Cremora, the top of the coffee creamer. Now... <laughs> Some of you may or may not remember that advert from many, many years ago. But I want you to know, in Luke 17, verse 21, Jesus makes a very powerful statement. He says this, Nor will they say, See here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Say, in me. So in the case of Cremora, You might not find it inside, you'll find it on top. But I want you to know, in the case of the kingdom of God, in the case of finding your sufficiency in Christ, you will definitely only find it inside. Look at the person next to you and say, it's inside. (laughs) To experience sufficiency in your life, you first must become aware and conscious of the abundance that is inside of you. You must become aware of the sufficiency of Christ and His salvation and the abundant resources of the kingdom. Then, when you become conscious of that inside, what's on the inside of you will start to manifest on the outside of you. You see, if if you're not experiencing the fullness of the kingdom in areas of your life this morning, it's easy to start looking outward and trying to find the solution. But I want you to know this morning, the solution is inside you. Because that's where the Holy Spirit lives. Can you say amen? That's where the kingdom of God resides, and that's where you build the kingdom of God. Colossians 1 verse 28, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church of Colossus, and we don't have time to recap all the information, so you can download the teaching off our website, you can download the teaching notes from last week, and I would strongly encourage you to do that. But here in verse 28 he says, Him we preach, who? Jesus. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. God wants you to be complete in Him. Can you say Amen? God doesn't want you to be relying on anything else on the outside. He wants you to be relying and developing your life in Christ Jesus. To this end, Paul says, I also labor, striving according to His working, which works in me mightily. Very powerful statement. We'll look at that a little bit later. I want you to know there's therefore, according to what Paul is teaching here, there's no special qualification or requirement for you to experience God's favor. You know, sometimes we, we buy into this philosophy or this thing, well, some people are more favoured than others. No, no, in Christ Jesus, there's no special requirement for His favour. Here's all you need to do to experience God's favour. Believe in Jesus. Can you say amen this morning, church? And uh, I want you to know, to that end, we, we last week started talking about the five trademarks of the Christian believer. The five trademarks that you should find in every local church. If you're visiting this morning and and you're thinking of joining this church, don't join this church until you make sure these five trademarks are effective and active in the church. If you're going back to your church, go and make sure that these five trademarks are active and and they a reality in the church where you're serving. They also need to be active in your life. And we looked at three of them last week and I'm certainly not going to take time to recap, but I couldn't get away from these three this morning. So I want to just take a few minutes and I want to add to what I shared last week and I want to build on that a little bit because I really feel it will help us this morning as we're developing these 
these trademarks in our lives. The first one we said last week was the grace of God. Paul carefully and methodically in the first eight verses of Colossians chapter 1, he teaches these five trademarks and he says, Church, if you're going to live for God, if you're going to be effective, if you're going to stand in the midst of, of, a, of trouble and circumstances and a world that is gripped uh, by evil, then I want you to, you need to, you need to make sure these five things are operating and are strong in your life. The first one is grace. He speaks here in verse 1 and 2 of Colossians chapter 1 and it says this Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy our brother to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossus grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, many people just discard the first two verses of this book because I think oh well Paul was just greeting them. No, 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 no. Paul was making a statement of faith and a statement of substance saying, listen, church, you need God's grace every day in your life. You need to learn how to walk in the peace of God. As a matter of fact, Paul was so serious about this. Every single book that he wrote in the New Testament starts with grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of Lord Jesus Christ. In some form, he includes... Not just that greeting, but that statement, that church. If you're going to be solid, if you're going to stand uh, the test of time, if you're going to be great in the kingdom of God, you need to understand the significance and the importance that grace plays in your life. Grace is so important. I want you to know, uh, remember this about grace this morning. The law demands, but grace supplies the power you need. Is there anyone here this morning, let me just check if I'm in the right church this morning, is there anyone here this morning, you've made a couple of mistakes this week? Hey, you, you did something maybe you shouldn't have, or you did something you didn't want to, and, and how you know, immediately the enemy comes and he tries to put condemnation on you and guilt on you. I want to encourage you this morning, the law demands grace supplies. All you need to do is come to Jesus and say, Lord, I messed up. Will you help me? And I want you to know His grace will supply the power to lift you out of that and move forward in the amazing power of the living God. That's why grace is called God's riches at Christ's expense. To me, the most powerful expression of grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Number two, the second trademark we, we established last week is so important is we said, number two, faith is a trademark of every believer. Number one is grace, number two is faith. I want you to know the church is not a building. I, I know we all say we came to church this morning, but the reality is the church came to the building this morning. Be because without you, the church is just a building. Can you say amen? So the church is not a building. It's a collection of people who have a simple faith in the living God. When we come together, we are the expression of Christ. And when we're out there, we are the body of Christ. We are the extension, the hands, the feet, and the mouthpiece of Jesus Christ. So the church is not a building. It's an individual and it's a collective group of people who have faith in the living God. I want you to know, when faith is replaced with doubt, which is rooted in fear, your whole structure and, and the whole foundation of your life is shaky. That's why the enemy's number one tool against you, against your life, and against what God wants to do in and through your life, is he tries to sow the seeds of doubt into your life. He gets you to try and question the validity of God's word, the validity of God's promises, and that will God really do what he said he'll do? I know he did it for Abraham, but will he do it for me? And it's so important this morning that you take the time, say you, Look at the person next to you and say you. Look at the person on the other side. Put your finger in their face and say you. Oh, come on. Some of you missed a great opportunity there. And I'm going to just take it myself. I'm not, I'm not supposed to get off here. But on the count of three, just say you. <laughs> Sorry, sound man. 
You have to take time to develop your faith. I, I can work with you, I can try and cooperate, I can try and support you, but at the end of the day, you have to build your faith on the Word of God. Can you say Amen? And so I want you to know, as, as I was just thinking about this, you know, where faith exists, joy and health exist. So as we build our faith and develop our faith, I want you to know uh, there's amazing things will happen. The Bible says you are saved by grace through faith. Grace and faith work together. You'll be amazed this morning as we, as we delve into this teaching a bit. You'll be amazed to see how these five things work with each other, support each other, develop each other, and, and give you a wholeness about your life. No wonder the enemy wants to try and steal your trademark and replace it with something else. Faith this morning, if you turn to Hebrews chapter 11, uh, I want to just take a few minutes here and, and, and let's build our faith together in the Word of God this morning. Hebrews chapter 11 is the faith chapter of the Bible. I mean, there are many other verses that speak about faith, but Hebrews 11 is kind of the, the climax, the culmination of faith. And, and right in verse 1, we looked at it last week, it says, Now faith is the substance. Then in, verses, uh, in verse 2, the, the writer of Hebrews makes a very powerful statement. He says, For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. How many of you would love to have a good testimony with God this morning? How many of you would love to have a good testimony? Well, the way to having a good testimony is learn to live by faith, develop your faith in God. Then in the next few verses we find three declarations of how this faith and how the elders made a good testimony. It says, by faith, by faith, by faith. Then in verse 6 we have a clarification of what faith is and how faith works. We read it last week, verse 6. It says, but without faith it is impossible to please God. How many of us want to please God this morning? Well, you're going to need the agent, the spiritual force of faith working with you. And then after verse 6 we find 15 consecutive declarations of how people in the Bible by faith accomplished great things for God. Faith is important this morning. And I want you to know, it says in these 15 declarations, it says, by faith they overcome. By faith they accomplished what God called them. By faith they moved into the victory. By faith they did and fulfilled the purpose of God. It's an incredible story. I want to go with you this morning and let's pick it up in verse 32. This is literally going to build your faith and encourage you this morning. In verse 32 it says, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell, to tell you of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets. <clears throat> Excuse me, verse 33. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness was made strong, became valiant in battle, turned, from flight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Verse 35. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Verse 36. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings. Yes, and chains of imprisonment. Verse 37. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with a sword, they wandered in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted and tormented. All these did what they did by faith. Can you see the diversity of how faith affects every single person's life? It affects no one in the same way. You might need to stop a line. You might need to quench the fire. You might need to build that marriage. You might need to have a victory in the business. Here's the thing this morning. By faith, you will overcome. God is not limited by your limitations. Can you say amen? God is well able this morning to help you get through what you're going through. Now here is the most incredible three verses of Hebrews 11. Verse 38. Of whom the world was not worthy, they wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. All these... All right, all these, everybody from verse 1 all the way down to where he gets here in verse 39, it says, all of these having obtained a good testimony through faith. Let's pause there. Were they living by faith? Did they accomplish great things by faith? Did they do awesome things for God? 
Okay, look at the next statement. All these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. So let me ask you something. Was their faith working? How come they didn't get the promise? Listen, faith accepts as reality what God has already said to you is reality, regardless of the circumstance. Some of these guys were in faith, trusting God for the promise. The promise was what? Salvation and the Holy Spirit. They didn't receive that. Look at the next verse. God having provided something better for us. Did you ever realize that you are in the Bible? You are not getting as excited as I did. I couldn't contain myself yesterday. Mandy was out. I was running up and down the stairs. I'm like, yes! There's my name right over there. That God provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Can I just check this morning? Are there any born again, Bible believing, devil stomping, on fire, filled with the Holy Ghost believers in the house this morning? Can I just have a, a great shout of praise from you this morning, please? You are a people of faith. Your father is Abraham. So let's look at a few things about faith this morning. Number one, you need to realize this morning faith can grow. It can grow strong or it can grow weak. Depending on what you do with it. Alright, so, so let's think about faith. How can I grow my faith this morning? Number one, you grow your faith by studying and confessing God's word. Get to know God through the Holy Spirit. Get to know God through the Word of God. Listen to me, church. If you don't take time every day or as often as you can to read your Bible, to pray, to confess the Word, your faith will not expand. Your faith will not stretch. Your faith will not support the things that you're going through. Faith grows through the Word. Romans 8 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Number two, the second way faith grows this morning is you've got to exercise it regularly. We've got a gym instructor and I'm sure there might be some others here. You know, you don't go to gym for one week and then that's it for the rest of your life. You've got to keep going. The sad thing about gym is you can go for a whole year and then miss four weeks and start again right at the beginning where you were a year ago. You don't pick up where you left off because when you don't exercise regularly, I want you to know you don't just stay where you are, you regress. So you've got to exercise your faith. I would encourage you every day have a faith project. Every day have something that you're focusing on in Christ that you're trusting for. Maybe it's just to get through the day. Can you say amen? Number three, faith grows by praying in the Spirit. Jude 20 says, praying in the Holy Ghost, building yourself up on your most holy faith. Very powerful reason to be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Number four, and, and you might know some others, I just want to give you the top four. The fourth way your faith grows this morning is I want you to know your faith grows through obedience. You see, when, when I take that next step of obedience that God wants me to take, it builds a confidence and a surety in my heart that supports everything that God says about me. And so every time I take a step of obedience, my faith grows and I say, wow, God met me in this situation. God was able to deliver me. I'm going to take the next step. And as you grow in obedience, so your faith grows. That's why Abraham was able to do far greater things down his life than he was when he started with God. Because faith develops as you develop and grow in obedience. Bump the person next to you and say, faith. Number three, the third one, we covered these last week. The third one is prayer. Number one, grace. Number two, faith. Number three, prayer. Prayer is so important. Prayer is a deep, honest, ongoing conversation with God as you seek, as you ask, and as you knock on the door of heaven. I want to encourage you this morning. Listen to what David said in Psalm 57, verses 1 to 3. He said, Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to, to me, for my soul trusts in you. And in the shadow of your wings I will make my refuge until all these calamities pass by. 
I will cry out to the Most High, to God Most High, to God who performs all things for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He reproaches the one who would swallow me up. Selah, God will send forth His mercy and His truth. Paul, uh, the, the psalmist here is talking about hiding himself in the blanket and, and the anointing of prayer. Seeking God, getting before God, not giving up. I want you to know the greatest curse in a believer's life is prayerlessness. When, when you're living your life and you're not connected to God through prayer, I'm not talking about a religious act you do. I'm talking about an ongoing heart connection with your daddy God that in any minute you can just connect with him and say, Father, I need you right now. This week my son had a terrible car accident and in that moment when, when it started to happen, the first thing out of his mouth to his friend was, let's pray right now. In the midst of all of that, the first thing was, let's pray. They protected today because of prayer, because of the prayers of the saints, because of the covering that comes when you daily seek God in prayer. Bump the person next to you and say, how's your prayer life this morning? Are you getting some help today? Can we go on this morning? Bump the person next to you say, yes, the pastor looks good this morning. <laughs> Come on, help me a little bit here. All right, number three is prayer. Number four, the fourth trademark of, of a strong believer, of a vibrant believer, and the life of the church, the fourth trademark is love. Love. Listen to what Paul says here in Colossians chapter 1. Remember, we're picking up from last week and I laid the foundation of why the book of Colossians was written. And you need to go and see that because it makes so much more impact and significance. But here in verse 4 of Colossians 1, listen to what he says. Since I heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all the saints. Again, in verse 8, he says who also came and declared to us your love in the Spirit. Love is a spiritual force. Love is powerful this morning. And I want you to know, these believers, their love wasn't a mechanical outward act or work. Their love was motivated uh, and birthed through the understanding of how much God loves them. Many in the church today are focusing on how much they love God, but I want you to know your focus should be on how much God loves you. Because when you realize and continually walk and receive the love of God, it does something in your heart, it does something in your soul that is absolutely incredible and mind-blowing. That expression, that reception of God's love in your life almost compels you. To love others. Now, you're going you're to enjoy this one uh, and j just make sure you're speaking to the right person. But would you look at the person next to you and say, I love you. Okay, now if you're sitting next to a guy, don't freak out. Don't freak out. We're, we're talking about the love of God. Can you say amen? Just look at them and say, it's okay. It's the love of God. Let me talk to you about love for a few minutes here, if, if you would permit me to do that. Let me make four statements about love. Number one, you need to realize this morning, you are already loved. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. For God so loved. We're talking about God's unconditional love. He gave that love to you long before you were saved. He gave that love to you while you were still a sinner, living in the world, serving the devil, doing whatever you wanted to do. Even after you got born again and you were still doing some of those things you shouldn't do, I want you to know God never stops loving you. Many in the church today are struggling under the bondage of works, under the bondage of guilt, under the bondage of struggling in things because they've never had a revelation. God loves you. Such a powerful statement. Number two, the love of Christ melts your heart and makes you fall in love with Him. I never ever thought that I could be so in love with two people at the same time. 
I love Mandy so much, but I love Jesus so much more. I love my children so much, but I love Jesus so much more. As a matter of fact, the love of Jesus keeps me in love with everybody else. I want to ask you this morning, uh, if you would turn with me to Revelation chapter 2 and verses 1 through 5. John is exiled on the Isle of Patmos. God gives him a vision. Supernaturally lifts him up into heaven and starts to paint for him a picture of the time of the end. And, and in the introduction of this, he, he gives John a letter to write to the seven churches that had been birthed. They were the main churches that, that had been birthed in the time that the church had been in existence since Jesus had died and raised and gone to be by the right hand of the Father. And here in verse 1 of chapter 2, the angel, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, the angel there is to the pastor, he's writing this letter to the leader of the church at Ephesus. Now I want you to know something really significant. Last week I said to you, the church of Coloss was birthed out of the church of Ephesus. It, it was a satellite church uh, out of the church of Ephesus which Paul had birthed and Epaphras had got born again there, then gone back to Coloss about a hundred miles from Ephesus and started the church there in the home of Philemon. And so I want you to know this letter was not just written to the church at Ephesus, it was written to the church at Ephesus and all those that were birthed out. So more than likely this letter was re read out to the church in Coloss. This is what he says to the angel of the church of Ephesus right. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Verse 2. I know your works, your labor, your patience that you cannot bear those who are evil, that you have tested those to say, who say they are apostles and are not and you have found them to be lies. Verse 3. You have persevered, you have patience you have labored for my name's sake and you have not become weary. How many you know at this point this church is doing real good? I mean their resume is looking sharp. Would you agree with me? Alright, let's read verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. Verse 5. Remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Notice he makes a statement to them. You left your first love. God never left you loveless. You leave your first love. Notice something else really significant. These guys were doing some amazing things in the church. They were meeting needs. They were praying for people. They were doing good works. They were being patient. They were striving against evil. They were doing all the things on the outside that made them look like this church rocks. Would you look at the person next to you and say, this church rocks. But God by the Holy Spirit bypasses all of that and he zones in on one thing and he says this, where is the love? Where is the love? Where is the love? I, I want to encourage you this morning and I want, to, I want to ask you this morning. You and I can do a whole lot of stuff but let's never forget our salvation experience. Let's never forget the day we got saved and Jesus Christ came into our lives and he radically turned us around. He gave us eternal life. He, 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 he changed our lives from where they were going to where they should go and he melted our hearts with his incredible love because I want you to know lest you just do things for the sake of doing them with no love. Love is so important this morning. I, I went before the God this week. Let me just confess to you and be transparent. I went before the Lord this week on my knees. I said, Lord, sorry for leaving my first love. And I want to ask you this morning as a church, what have you replaced that first love with? Say, Pastor, but I don't sin. No, I'm not talking about sin. Maybe, maybe you're doing everything just right. Maybe you're praying, you're serving, you're reading, you're doing, da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. but God wants to know, where is the love? 
You might say, Pastor, are you, are you coming down on us? Well, I, take it wherever it comes from. The truth is this. Let's never lose our first love. That intimacy, that love for God. I went from being an unbeliever, serving the devil, living my life the way I wanted to, a born again, blood washed, blood paid for believer that just loved everybody. In one single moment of salvation. I don't know what your experience was, but I want you to know this morning, let's not become like the Japanese converts at Billy Graham's crusade many, many years ago. He preached an incredible message to a full auditorium of over 10,000 people in Japan. At the end of, of the message, the presence of God was there, the power of God was there, and he said through his interpreter, all those who want to be saved, will you stand to your feet? And the whole auditorium stood up. He got really excited really quickly. It was like, what a move of God. But he had been serving God a long time and he was wise enough to know that it's probably unlikely that every person in the auditorium wanted to be saved. So he turned to his interpreter and he said, what's going on? He said, no sir, you don't understand. You are our guest in Japan and whatever you ask us to do, we must do it because we, you are our guest. He said, many of these people, all they will do is they will say the prayer, they will leave here tonight, and they will go on living the way they've always lived. They will just add Jesus to all the other gods they already serve. And Billy Graham turned to the interpreter, he said, tell everybody to sit down. And he said this, he said, I want you to stay seated. Unless you personally want to make a decision to lay down everything else and allow Jesus Christ to become the Lord of your life. And only a handful of people stood up. I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you just adding Jesus to everything else in your life? Or are you going off to Christ with all of your heart because he's melted you and the love of God is living on the inside of you? Church, this is a serious moment for every one of us. Let's allow the love of God to constrain us. Let's, allow, let's fall in love with Jesus again. Else we'll just go through the motions, we'll come every week and we'll just become another religious organization that has no meaning, no reality and no power. I don't know about you, I don't want that. Can you say amen this morning? Alright, let's move on. Number three, the third thing about love this morning is love creates security and makes me bold. When I understand the love of God, 1 John 4, verse 16 and 17 says this, and we know and have known and believed that the love that God has for us. We have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of of judgment. If you receive and, and take hold of God's love for you, it will make you secure. You won't worry about your insecurities. You won't be phased by the way you look and by how other people see you. You'll be moved by the fact that God is madly in love with you. He has approved you and He's put His stamp of approval on your life. Can you say Amen? Big ears, big nose, uh, fat bum and all that other stuff. God loves you the way you are. Can you say Amen? Number four, the love of God or the real love of God is expressed in the way we treat other people. The test of a true vibrant New Testament church is not the size, the works, the preaching, the gifting, the worship, it's the love. You say, Pastor, aren't those other things important? No, they are very important. Don't misunderstand me. We want the good preaching. We want the, the great worship. We want the works. We want to give out the blankets. We want to do all of that. It's brilliant. But let me tell you, the defining mark of a vibrant church is the love of God that is displayed to God and amongst the believers. When you're going through something, I'm going through something. Can you say amen? When you're high, I'm high because we're connected through the love and the grace of Jesus. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, I will show you you a more excellent way. 
the way of love. Can you say amen? Bump someone next to you and say, I love you, my brother or my sister. Everything is important, but I want to know, when you have a real love in your heart towards other people, it will heal the hurt. It will melt the hardness. It will talk to the unlovely. It will... It will not judge the other brother, but it will pray for them. That's the love that God wants in the church. There are many in the church today, uh, and, and I know my time's up, but if you'll just give me uh, two or three more minutes so that I can conclude this. We have uh, what the doctors refer to in the medical profession, the white coat syndrome. Do any of you know what the white coat syndrome is? We're petrified to go to the doctor because we're scared of what he's going to tell us, but we know he's got the experience to actually help us. So we rather go without the help because we're petrified of seeing the doctor. And I want to know that happens in the church as well. We're so scared to go and talk to the pastor and tell him what's really going on, lest he think we're actually not saved or we're not faith. Guys, guys. I was talking to some of the elders. They were like, I don't want to be an elder anymore because I don't get the scoop anymore. The minute I became an elder, it's like I was put on a platform and now nobody wants to tell me what's going on in their lives. Church, the elders are here to help you go through what you're going through in your life. Pastor Manny and I are here to help you go through what you're going through in your life. And I want you to know, sorry to disappoint you, Mandy is not perfect. We are working on this. <laughs> no, we, we are not perfect. We, we occasionally argue. We get into each other's face. We make wrong decisions. We, we're just as human as you are when we get off this platform. But here's the difference. God has called us and anointed us to do and fulfill the function. It's not by our ability or power. It's by the grace of Jesus Christ through faith, through prayer, and through learning and understanding the love of God. The last one this morning, we won't get into it because our time's up. The fifth trademark of a, of a believer and of a vibrant church is hope. Hope. Listen, hope is probably the most underestimated force of the New Testament. We love to preach on grace. We love to preach on faith. We love to talk about prayer. We love to uh, share the love of God. But I want you to know, if you don't have hope, None of those things will work properly. I don't have time to go into it, but I'll give you the scriptures. You can go look at Colossians 1 verse 5 says, Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. The word hope is the, is the word el peche. It means to anticipate with pleasure or confidence. You go read Hebrews chapter 6 from verse 13 all the way through to verse 21. You'll see the incredible role that hope has in the life of the church. As a matter of fact, when anybody walks into this church as a visitor, the first thing they should come in contact with is the love of God and the hope of God. Because they see in us an expectation of how awesome God is. How wonderful God is. That we, we're, of, we're in this earth, but we're not of this earth. Heaven is our home. Can you say amen? You're just an ambassador here on earth. Your real home is heaven. And that hope cannot be squashed. The, the Bible says in Hebrews, it's the anchor of our soul. And I want to encourage you this morning to develop your hope. I don't have time uh, to, to elaborate on this, but go read Romans chapter 5, verse 1 to 5, and you'll see the incredible way that, that hope is developed. It's developed in, in troubles, circumstances, and through your perseverance, which creates experience, and that experience builds hope. Because when you go through things and you use the Word of God and you use your faith, it grows a hope in you that even although you're facing the most horrible situation this morning, you still have hope because you know with God all things are possible. You know as well, if it doesn't happen here on earth, like all those heroes of Hebrews 11, if it doesn't happen down here, it will happen up there because you are heaven bound. <laughs> That's the most amazing thing. So I'll close with this this morning. Paul goes on in verse 9 through 12 and he prays an incredible prayer for the church. He prays that they would grow in the knowledge of God. He prays that they would walk worthy of Him. He prays that they would be strengthened by Him 
and that they would come to the place that they would understand their inheritance.